Okay, our next speaker is Eric Klein, who is the better looking half of Cloudonix. Third. Now, if that doesn't scare you, <laughs> wait until you hear what he has to say. Where you go, Eric. I don't even know where to go with an opening from that. First off, it's the better, the better part of the third. There are three of us. Uh, only Nier still has hair. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed last night and our happy hour. Um, anybody who wants more of the RFID protector covers, I'd rather not carry them home. Uh, and there's stickers on the tables in the back. Okay. A little bit about me. Husband, father, grandfather, hopefully soon to be again grandfather. They tell me you can't multiply those. It's not, I'm a grandfather two times. It makes it complicated. Uh, I've been talking since Astrocon 2011 on VoIP security. And uh, James is not in the room. Uh, I got roped into a panel with Nier um, where we started talking about fraud and asked, OK, do you have any examples? And some guy put his hand up in the back. And there were no cameras officially running at that one, but uh, Tom Keating from TMC actually pulled out his iPhone and recorded it. And the guy said, I got hacked, my company got hacked $400,000 in two days. Um, which led to that evening somebody coming up to me in the bar with, which is what Simon was referring to, and he came up and stood over near an eye while we were sitting there having our after con drink. You scared the fucking shit out of me. And this kind of set the benchmark for all of the security talks afterwards. Later in the week we had a chat and uh, James Bodie, who I guess is in the other room, proceeded to give all sorts of fraud examples that he had been involved with or heard about and stuff. And it was very enlightening. So what we've come up with is the concept that VoIP fraud, VoIP monitoring are really important topics. And I'll be going over both of them a little bit. Um, the security part wasn't actually, that's interesting. I actually turned everything onto flight mode um, to avoid just that. So th this is where the VoIP uh, prevention and fraud, I'll talk more about that towards the end, uh, involved with various startup advising from somebody who's doing their own clothing line uh, to all sorts of tech stuff. Uh, as some of you will have noticed through the Twitterverse, um, including Randy's post this morning, uh, I'm an author. Uh, my first novel came out in March. Um, and apparently I got the right target audience because people are coming up to me uh, Randy, Mira, others who have looked at it and said, I like it. It's the right kind of people, it's the right kind of science fiction, so good. Um, but now on to more important things. Okay, you're all involved with technology, and the obvious question of when do you actually start monitoring your network systems? And I'm not just talking VoIP network, when do you monitor your actual production or s company systems? Okay, do you start monitoring after the first customer calls and goes, what the hell's wrong with you guys? What happened? Do you actually look at when you're doing the pre-production, when you're going into production? Or when management starts going, wait, we're putting contracts with SLAs, how are we actually proving that we're living to them? Any guess? I think everybody's still tired from last night. Okay. Okay? The moment it's up, you start monitoring it. Oh, that's strange. It's supposed to be bringing up at the bottom the minute you finish the first line of code. Okay? You actually start monitoring and testing, or you end up like this, staring at the screen. The, the servers are going, what the fuck's going on? Been there, done that. Okay. Let's go with a little bit of background. There are actual standards, especially in telecom, hmm, related to how you do monitoring, how you manage telecom networks. There's an entire uh, International Standards Union, the ITU, back here, that does these kinds of things. And we're specifically looking at the operations section today. So you've got your CRM, you've got the various support monitoring, you've got the billing. These I'm not worried about, CRM I'm not worried about. Okay, if you do not know who your customers are and what you're charging them, that's a whole different conversation and problem. Okay, and you want to talk A2 billing or not A2 billing, I'll be happy to have that conversation later also. 
okay? But actual looking at the assurance section, the kind of pink section in the middle. When do you, how do you handle the problems? How do you do your QA and quality of service? All the way down, do you actually go down to problem reporting? How do you work up the hierarchy from how does somebody contact you to how do you actually handle it? These are the kinds of things that I want to look at and talk about in the monitoring side. So again, why do you want to monitor? Okay, you obviously want to know the state of your servers, your network, your service, how it's doing, when it's doing. Okay, you want to know what's going to happen before the customer calls and complains. The more proactive you are, and you, the customer says, okay, I have an outage. You go, yes, we're aware of this outage. We're in the process of fixing it. We expect it'll be fixed in another 15 minutes or whatever because we know what's wrong is a great place to be. The, oh, you have a problem? Let me see what's going on is not exactly the best place to be for customer service. Okay, and you want to proactively anticipate this. Okay, stop reacting, be more proactive. Okay, why do you need to know? Okay, again, know the state of the servers, the product, learn about bottlenecks and preemptively design your network and improve things on the network um, and start tracking changes that are happening. Okay, so again, when should you start monitoring? Not when you're doing QA, not when you're doing load testing, end-to-end -end testing or staging. You do it when the first line of code is done before you get this lovely error. Okay? And we've actually run into fun things where I actually had to look up what exactly does bad bot error mean? Not a fun message to get. Um, okay. Now that you know why, then you need to know what. What are you monitoring? Okay. So what kind of devices are you checking? Okay. Are you going down to the laptop and the storage devices? for your team, not for your customers, okay? Are you going for the infrastructure? Are you going for the various voice systems, okay? More important than deciding what to monitor is deciding what not to monitor. How many of you recognize this picture? This is a tar drop. They approximately drop once every five to seven years. I don't want real-time monitoring on that. That's going to be an awful lot of nothing happened. Okay? So you need to know what is relevant in real-time and what is noise. Yes, they run a video camera when they think that it's going to get close so they can actually get snapshots to see it drop, but this thing can take days to actually separate because it's tar. It's very thick. It's very slow. Okay. Knowing what you want to monitor helps determine what tools you want to use to monitor. And I'm not going to go through all of these. There are various ones that have different things. We had a discussion yesterday on Homer, um, which I'm very pleased to see that they're now going to JSON, not just uh, their older APIs. You've got Nagios and Isinga. Um, these tend to be the preferred ones within the community. Once you get to the larger companies, the $100 million tier two, tier one carriers, they don't go Isinga, they don't go Nagios, they go um, Amdocs, they go TTI, they go all of the various Compaq, all of the larger systems, CA or whatever, which come with $10 million price tags. I know, I've helped sell them. In fact, I spent one year trying to sell three different divisions of the Costa Rica telecom company because all of them wanted a full-blown end-to-end everything system at $15 million each. And then they put out the proposal saying, no, now we want an over system to sit on top of all of the other systems for a different 15 million. They ended up scrapping the little ones and going for the big one. Okay, there are lots of tools. Homer is awesome if you want to understand what's going on at the SIP level. Okay, Humbug looks at telecom fraud. Okay, uh, disclaimer, I'm involved with that project still. Um, we look at CDRs to see what is going on so you can see what fraudulent activity is in near real time. So it can help uh, proactively do it so you get $50 fraud, not $200,000, $400,000 fraud. Um, and we'll get into some of the security issues later. Okay. But this is a case studies discussion. So I'm going to talk about a couple of customers that we've worked with that we know about and what they did and what kinds of monitoring that was appropriate for them. So we had a small business, one location in the US, 
50 different local phone numbers in the New York area. Uh, VoIP makes it very easy to pretend that I'm sitting in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in Staten Island, in Queens, in the Bronx, even when I'm sitting in one house in Long Island. Okay, that's where their phone center was. Okay, they wanted to know what was going on with the service, make sure the calls were going up because every call was potentially a $50 to $200 service call. I've locked my car keys in the car. I can't get into my apartment. I need you to open my safe. Whatever the things were, these were the kinds of calls that they were getting. Okay, as you can guess, it was a locksmith. Okay, um, so we, they didn't care about real-time monitoring, so they wanted to know every 15, every 20, every hour that things were going and the tests were going on. The problem that they had was they had various firewall and ISP problems regarding getting the VoIP working. So they had a, a firewall that would not allow SIP to work properly, so we had to go through reconfiguring it. Or their ISP would periodically change the IP address of their router. Okay? Having a natted IP address that changes every 48 to 72 hours gets very frustrating when you're connecting back to a cloud server. Because how do you authenticate that one? Oh, it's working. Oops, no longer works because it's a different IP address. So it makes writing the fail to ban rules, the firewall rules, much more challenging. You have to kind of play these kinds of games to make it work. Okay? And we realized this would work much better so if we did some real-time monitoring, see what's going on, see when it changed so we could actually trigger activities for the new IP addresses. Second company, multinational company, um, currently based in, headquartered in Boston, 11 offices, 10 countries around the world, ranging from Melbourne, Bangalore, um, Mumbai, Berlin, London, Israel, Sao Paulo, Boston, and two others I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, have been working with them for a number of years. We put in real-time monitoring, and they wanted to know what was going on at the PBX level, so it was doing Isinga monitoring. Recently, we've had a little bit more fun with them because they decided, ooh, our Bangalore call center needs to have high availability. We're using free PBX, and we don't want to use free PBX high availability module. So they hired a local tech company to come in and mirror the two servers and put a Sangoma box in front of them to bounce between, and then they're using uh, bare metal level mirroring and update changes on the background. It's mostly working, okay? But they had a more interesting problem. They put in an office in Brazil, down in Sao Paulo, and could not actually get two-way SIP to work. They could hear the other person, they could not be heard. And we've discovered that because of the way the ISP was running the data, that the uh, Palo Alto firewall was not playing nice with SIP and was blocking the RTP on one direction. So it made monitoring and testing this became a challenge, but we found out because we were actually able to use, in this case, things like Homer to actually listen to and monitor the channel to know what's going on. Okay? So again, 24-hour call center. They were getting calls to numbers. The best one, and I'm in England, so I'm going to get shot for this one. I, I mentioned this, and Dan proceeded to give me a hard time at IT Expo because um, I pronounce English town names incorrectly. So they have an office here in England, and they were getting calls in. Now, mind you, the office is there for 11 years, has never had a toll-free number. Suddenly they're getting calls in from, into a toll-free number, terminating in their office near London from Nottingham, Nottinghamshire or Shire? I always get this one wrong and you always give me a hard time. Nottinghamshire, okay the job placement office. So all of these people who are out of work, looking for jobs, are calling a toll-free number here and ending up making a connection some 150, 200 miles away, more or less. That about right? Um, and they've got no idea where that came from. It took three weeks of sending logs and traces back to BT before BT said, no, we don't see it. No, the, the trace is more than 48 hours. We can't use it. And went back and back, and BTs kept going, no, 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 it's not us. It's a problem. It must be your 800 number. We never had an 800 number. And then suddenly, after the last round of traces, the problem disappeared. Oh, we didn't change anything. 
No, they just stopped responding. Okay? The ever popular, we've changed nothing, we know nothing. There was no problem on our end, but the problem dis disappeared. Okay? I like it's fixed. I'm really pissed that I don't know what was wrong so I can prevent it again. Having a similar problem with the first one from San, uh, San Paulo, currently in India, again, one-way audio using Skype for business. Real pain in the butt when you deal asterisk and Skype for business. When the servers are in two physical different continents. Never mind. So what we set up was, this is the older version of Isinga, and we were just doing simple monitoring. What's the status? Is the SSH up? Is the HTTP connected? Are the processes running? And we were running it for the Isinga and Nagios have modules for all sorts of things, asterisks, for SIP modules, for monitoring, that plug in and can tell what's going on. So we found this very useful. Up and running, they're very happy. We frequently call them and go, OK, so why are you having a problem in Minnesota? They're like, we're not, oh, we have a problem in Minnesota. Let me check on that. Or why did it reboot here? Oh, yeah, they were doing service. We should have told you. We're now calling them and saying, OK, we're seeing something wrong with your system. What's going on? And since they're paying maintenance for us, that's a wonderful place to be. OK? We were working with an MVO here in the UK. Unfortunately, they shut down um, relatively not long ago. And full-blown network, OK? Servers, everything that they had. And again, it was real-time alerts, connectivity checking, call quality, they were much more interested in things related to the homer and call quality than the server uptime, which we needed to know. Okay? So again, I single looking at the various things, and again, like I said, the, have, they have specific ones for asterisk monitoring that are pre-configured. Writing your own is simple, but if they've got them that you can just download, Nagios plugins work into Isinga and vice versa, why not use them? Why reinvent the wheel? Okay? Um, so we got into a, the fourth and final one I'm going to be talking about a little bit more, um, is a service company that was looking at doing things worldwide. Again, they wanted to monitor the servers, process status, and in this case, we went with the Isinga 2 dashboard, which looks a little bit different, um, it's a couple years old now, to give a more um, knock feel, because they wanted to put this up into their knock and show what was going on, so they could bring investors and customers in. And OK, you all know something about telecom. How many of you have walked into a company who has this big room full of people and the big screens in, in there, and it looks like something out of Star Trek? Circa 1960, 66, OK? That room is the dog and pony show room, OK? The people who are sitting in that room, except possibly the manager who's sitting in the back and doesn't have anything, don't care what's on the screen, and they tend to ignore it. But when you bring in customers, they like seeing that you have this whole command center with big screens and you can launch the space shuttle. Doesn't matter that we haven't launched the space shuttle in more than a decade. They want to know that you could. So they like pretty pictures and dials and other stuff. Um, so you have the traditional look and feel of the old Isinga that the techs actually work with. And then you have the one that you put on the big screen because you get all of the counters and dashboards and colors and stuff that people like. Monitoring and network management has a very fine line between it's functional and it's dog and pony show. Okay? Most of us are tech people. Okay? We come from the side where I want functional. I don't care what it looks like pretty. Show me how I get into the data I need to fix it. Management wants pretty. So you have to find a tool that gives you a balance between them. So understand your audience and why. Okay? How many of you are doing things on the cloud these days? I'm surprised. There's more than half of the room who didn't raise their hand. Um, cloud, VoIP, and telecom has a number of interesting caveats and a number of interesting problems. And this is near specialty. I'm not going to get into all of that. This is what we do. We have a lot of fun with making cloud sit up and uh, do tricks. But there are certain clouds that are better at things than others. Okay? And if you look on YouTube, Nir gave a lovely talk three years ago where the best answer for which cloud to use is frequently several. Okay? Google does this well, Amazon does this well, DigitalOcean, whichever one, they each have areas that they're better at. They're not identical one to one. Um, 
and you have to look at the terms and conditions and the rules. Okay, so last time I looked, Google actually has rules against doing voice over IP on servers on their cloud. You can do other things, but if it, you're an actual telecom service, which sort of competes with Google, you're technically against terms and conditions for doing it. So you need to look at things, what tools are available, what tools do you want built into the cloud before you start putting tools on top of it. Okay, so if you're using CloudWatch, this is important. Okay, don't try and figure out how I'm going to monitor the server level, the operating system level on a Amazon instance. Let CloudWatch do it for you. That's what they've got designed for. Okay, stack driver. Uh, Microsoft has their own, uh, Alibaba has their own. Uh, I understand Walmart is coming out and they'll probably have their own. Each one of them, they have to monitor the health for things and they expose that to you either via a dashboard or an API. Use it, don't reinvent the wheel. Okay? Most of them will plug in directly or indirectly using Elasticsearch, uh, uh, ELK, to come into the same feed so you can get it all onto the same screen. Look at what the tools are and what you're connecting. Okay? We actually got into a conversation Monday night. Um, we used to be involved with, the, the, the company used to be, parent company was called Greenfield. Okay? Anybody know in telecom what a Greenfield means? Okay, theoretically a, a greenfield concept, and it's a concept I've always had a problem with, I'm building from a clean plate, completely empty, I can do anything I want, there are no restrictions. Which is a lovely concept when you're building something from scratch, and a lot of us have done, I know Sean, for example, have done a lot of things from scratch, okay? But the truth of the matter is, when you're building from scratch, it's not really completely up to you to decide. I'm using this piece of hardware, therefore I need to use this network manager to do this monitoring. I'm doing this in Google, so I have to use this tool. I'm using Amazon. It's not like I can choose anything I want and no, there are no restrictions. It's kind of a, if you look at the field out in the back of the, behind the hotel, it's a big empty field, but there's a tree here and a shrub there and those funny deer um, things. Okay, you have to take those into account. It may be greenfield and you can do almost anything you want, but these individual items are there in the way. So you have to actually know what's there and know what APIs they use, what interfaces. We've run into an interesting case where this one uses SOAP and we use JSON. How do I convert between the two to make sure that I'm communicating correctly? Who's using diameter? Who, these are more interesting and you end up using tools like Beanstalk D or others to kind of play the mediation layer to translate for you. So you need to know what you're using, what the rules are, what the tools that already exist are, otherwise you're creating things from scratch. Okay, I've got another 10. Um, how big the network and process you're working on doesn't matter. If it is a mission critical service, and for a hotel, for a business where everything comes in from the phone system, that's mission critical. They may not think of it that way, but if the phone system goes down, you get no calls, you get no sales, you get new orders, that's a problem. Okay, so it can be as small as a single PBX system where connection on the lag between the carriers becomes a problem. If people can't hear you, they hang up and they call your competitor. Okay, multi-sites. Okay, once you're doing multi-sites in one city or one country, it's complicated enough. Once you start doing multiple continents, okay, I gave the example, Australia, Europe, Asia, um, North America, and I'll count England separate because it's physically separate, and then South America, it gets very complicated to get the timing, to get the interconnects and get everybody working correctly. Look at what your big picture is, not the little. You have to kind of balance the two, okay? And we had this talk, um, I got actually pulled into a very strange chat uh, panel at IT Expo back in February, and the title was, My Phone System Sucks, What Can I Do About It? And I'm sitting here with a guy from Sangoma who wants to sell you hardware or free, uh, free PBX, uh, possibly cloud service. And I've got another guy sitting next to me who's trying to sell you cloud services from one of the carriers. And they're trying to explain why it's cloud versus, and it's like, no, no. It's not cloud versus premise. Both have benefits and, and uh, disadvantages. Understand what your customer needs is 99% of the time the problem of why the customer thinks it sucks. The customer says, I want X, Y, and Z, and then you're supposed to interpret that into 300 different actual technical requirements. 
And the moderator got up and said, okay, we did this. I did a major conversion from physical to digital for a company. And they forgot to mention that they've got this one toll-free number that they've had for 10 years. So we didn't port it over. And they only noticed six months later that they weren't getting calls from that number, at which point it had been reverted back because it had been abandoned, went back into the general pool and somebody else had taken it. So 10 years of marketing of a particular toll-free number thrown out the window because they didn't actually go through a proper checklist, a proper test of what is needed, what the customer wants, what it has to do, what they have, what you're converting. Okay? Very bluntly put, those of us in this room, we're supposed to know better, we're supposed to know how to guide the customer because, yeah, I want a phone system that works. Does that mean this and this? And they will get frustrated when you start asking them 50 or 60 questions. Do you need this? Does everybody need a voicemail box? What do you want to allow? But if you don't do that, they're going to get pissed and they're going to screw up your reputation. There's nothing worse than a vindictive, angry customer in the Twitter age. Okay? Welcome to the future. We wanted communications that could be instantaneous that everybody could use, and now they're coming back to bite us. So know what your customer's needs are, even when the answer is, I know what you asked for, this is wrong, or I know what you asked for, I'm not the one who can provide that, let me show you who can. So it's, you not need to know when to balance the give part of the business away to make a happy customer. It will come back four or five fold in your favor later when they say, yeah, these guys didn't want to screw me over, so they got me what I needed. Go talk to them, they'll give you the, the straight scoop. Okay, and Nir and I have gone through, I don't know how many companies who've come to us, oh yeah, we got a quote from this, isn't, and they're offering it for $1,000. We look and we go, it's an $8,000 project. It's a $20,000, they're giving it me to, for 1,000. Good luck. Oh, you mean you're not gonna match it? Like, no. There was a case a couple years ago where Huawei was giving away VoIP equipment to carriers. Any of you know this one? They were literally coming over and giving it Oh, you need H23, uh, 323 SIP? That's extra. So they go in, they install it, and then they try to do interconnects, find out that, oh, that's extra. That you have to pay for. And it's not worth doing business that way. You can race to the bottom for price and then start doing, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, or you can do it straight. It's a question of which way your customers respond better and which one you're more comfortable working in. Okay? Other things to think about when you're dealing with your network management. How do you handle trouble ticketing and customer self-service portal? What can you allow them to do or fix on their own? What do you need to do on your own? Initially, you're probably going to want to err on the side of you doing it, and slowly as you figure out how to expose the things to them in ways that'll work, you can go further. But it's a question of how you want to do this. How do you put out a knowledge base of, yes, I have a problem, this is how you fix it? Okay, how do you put out a company wiki, a whatever, uh, Confluence, whatever tool you want to use, go out and create the knowledge base so they can do the looking up because some of these people will never pick up a manual, but will Google. So knowing these things are important. How do you monitor errors in your code? Which tools do you use? How do you do intrusion detection? Okay. What logs are you using to know who made the change? Is it internal? Is it external? Who made it? Especially when you need to go and smack somebody on the knuckles for screwing up the entire network. Uh, I lived through and, and got to watch the wonderful case of, oh yeah, WorldCom entire network went down. AT&T lost their entire network for two weeks because somebody accidentally did a Cisco update um, that went and proceeded to update the routing tables on a router, which then cascaded out to every other router, which then proceeded to send it out to every router, and they suddenly had no bandwidth because every router was updating every 15 seconds. Okay, it literally meant shut everything down and bring them up one at a time slowly. But you have to understand what's going on and you need to know when you need to slap somebody on the, the knuckles. Okay. Um, as a carrier or a customer, know what your contract says. Know when you can negotiate better rates, know when you can put in limits, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, again, places to block, uh, what trends are going on that will benefit you. Five minutes, got it. Okay, so we'll go very quickly through some of, the uh, some of the security stuff. As a guest, we're sitting here in England, and uh, I don't remember who was talking, I think it was Simon actually was talking yesterday and mentioned history. 
Okay? Anybody know when the first communications hack actually happened? I'd be happy if somebody can get it within 50 years. Nobody? 1903. It, it's literally 1903, June 4th. Marconi was doing a demonstration here into London of the first wireless secure communication for using for the Royal Navy. And he managed to piss off a ham radio operator who was playing around with, in, with that kind of stuff at the time, who was a magician, and really pissed him off. So he gets up and gives this wonderful demonstration. And just before they're getting ready to send out their first Morse code message, this comes through. Just simple Morse code at the bottom. And Marconi's assistant, who's standing there in the Royal Albert Hall in front of the Royal Academy of Science and the Navy, goes, rats, rats, rats. And that's all he was doing, which is repeating. Just before they were able to send out their secure, nobody can listen, effectively early encryption, private communication, the entire thing was, was blown up in their face. Ever since then, we're dealing with the same particular types of attacks for a new generation of equipment. So in the 1960s and 50s, we had the 2600 uh, megahertz people hacking and going into systems, or it's constantly repeating. They're just finding new ways to do the same thing. So very quickly, the various people who's attacking for hire, organized crime, terrorist kids, the truth of the matter is, is that this is actually these two are, are making very good money on very low risk, and they're beginning to move away from it already because we're no longer as profitable as they, it could be for them. So the CFCA puts out a study every uh, two years. It's an organization, the M5, FBI, various carriers are all part of it. Um, and you look at some of the last year's reports, the top fraud attacks, PBX and IPBX hacking for just under uh, four, million, uh, four billion dollars annual loss. Us or our customers are now targets. What do they do? They make premium number calls or expensive calls to interesting countries. They make these so they can get revenue share usually. So the obvious question is, do your customers actually need traffic terminating in Cuba, in Latvia, in uh, Algeria? You're a local shop that has traffic that does, goes no more than 50 miles from where you're sitting. Why do you need international calls to be allowed? Block them at the carrier. Block them in the PBX. Two minutes. Okay, so we'll go over here quick. What do they get from it? Cash. Bragging rights, which happens occasionally. Um, I already told you the story back in Denver. The interesting thing is, while we were on stage in Denver in 2011, um, about 100 miles north of here, a cabinet maker's PBX was being hacked. Got hit with 25,000 pounds worth of damage. Ran into the case where he ended up getting charged by his phone company, and he sued them for it. And surprisingly won. The terms and conditions in his agreement said that he had to use all reasonable and proper security procedures. And he used everything that they had suggested and recommended and did all best practices. The hack came one level above him. The carrier ended up eating the cost and changing their terms and conditions. Read your contract, understand what you're liable for. Okay, so I'm gonna go very quickly on this. How many of you ever heard of the internet census? Somebody went out and scanned all of IPv4 which changes every couple of years, but they actually went out and did it and published it, telling people things like, what ports are available on a device, which means I have a target for hacking. And the last one, Shodan. Shodan HQ allows you to go and do a search for a particular type of hardware. Their most popular search, according to them, is Cisco default password. We did a talk in 2013, Nier got, I talked about this, Nir got up and presented to put a polycom on this. Before he finished hitting enter, and it came on the screen, 30 seconds later somebody's like, I'm in. First one on the, on the screen, 
They said, okay, I've got an IP address, I've got that default user, default password. They were in, they had hacked somebody's Polycom conference phone. This stuff is publicly available on the internet. Know who you are and what you're publishing. So be careful what you advertise. Sipfish, as you probably all know, I'll not go into too much. It's a wonderful tool for protecting or hacking, depending on which side of the fence you want to sit on. This is the various devices. And harden your system. Know what you can do at the operating system, at the carrier level, physical access. Does the conference room need a voicemail? Does the server room or the kitchen need a voicemail, which can be hacked and then rerouted? Okay, and in that case, we'll go to this one real quick. Questions? We're out of time for, for questions, but... Oh, uh, I'm out of time? But the good news is it's now a coffee break, so by all means, uh, hang around and interrogate Eric. We're, uh, we're due back here at uh, 11 o'clock for the next talk. So if any of you want more RFID protectors, come on up. We have stickers, we have fun stuff. Come seniors. Um, workshop tomorrow on how to use uh, ARI for asterisks. Thank you. Thank you, Eric.